Evening, everyone. We're going to be starting in just under a minute. So if you'd like to find your seats. Thank you. Right, good evening everybody. Good to have you here at Fountain. Welcome to those joining us online as well. Great to have you with us. And uh, yeah, it's good to be together again. I've been isolating, so it's good to be with community. Uh, absolutely grateful uh, that my family and I could pull through COVID as well. So yeah, wonderful to be here. And we'd like to welcome any guests if you are with us, visiting us for the first time, we'd like to give you a chocolate. Normally, we offer you a cappuccino or a hot chocolate, but our coffee bar or coffee shop is closed at the moment. Another announcement is that our golf day that we were going to have on the 9th of July has been postponed because of COVID, and that was in, in aid of the Malawi mission trip. And uh, also, there's a, a couple of us were on a call uh, recently about this new bull that's out, the Papuda bull. It's, uh, it's a real threat to our religious freedom. And I'd encourage you, please, to sign that petition. It was sent out on the church WhatsApp, and there are some forms in the foyer. If you'd like to fill that out, it's very, very important that each one of us uh, sign that. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not just for churches and pastors. It's literally for every one of us that profess Jesus as Lord. And uh, so it's very, very important that we uh, just take the time to do that, please. So if you can, uh, fill it in. Those are available in the foyer, and you can put it in the box. There is a box there that you can put it in. And then on Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., we're going to be having an evening here at the church for those uh, exploring the call of God on your life. And that includes a marketplace call as well. If you're sensing God's calling you to serve more or be more involved or wanting to use your gifts, wanting to get more involved in the church or, and, or start something at work, uh, please join us uh, this week, Tuesday, uh, right here at Fountain. And then uh, Mithali Baby Haven, uh, which is on my left at the end of the car park over there, uh, Kate and Richie are now going to be opening another ministry called Sharon's House, and that'll be a shelter for pregnant moms in crisis, and that's opening on the 1st of July. Uh, in the foyer, there is a notice there with a list of some of the needs that they have, so please grab one of those on your way out. By the way, our notice board has all these notices as well, uh, in case you did miss anything or you want to take a flyer. There's also uh, banking details as well for those that like to do EFTs. Next week, Sunday, we'll be joining Cameron McIntosh to go and pray at uh, the Edge Hospital. That is near St. George's. So if you'd like to come in, uh, we're just going to dedicate that basically to the Lord. We're going to just go and pray. They'll be opening up in, in early July. So please make yourself available for that next week, Sunday at 12 o'clock. And then the East Wing update. Um, Warwick, won't you just come and lift that board for us quickly, please? So our East Wing, I don't know if you have all seen, but it's looking really good. Eh? It's looking like it's getting close to finished, and we have raised 636,000 Rand and need uh, just under 1.5 million uh, to finish paying for that. So if you'd like to give towards that, thank you. Uh, you can just mark that as East Wing or as the building fund. We appreciate uh, every little bit that helps, Sam. Eh? And then... I uh, said that, just please also keep, make sure you, you wear your masks at all times. Uh, and unfortunately, we're not going to be serving any coffee either at this point in time. So appreciate um, 
everyone just complying with that. Uh, thank you. And then uh, Sara, do you want to come up? We're going we're gonna to invite Sara up. She's going to be sharing the word with us tonight, and we're very excited. And just a reminder, um, when worship starts, our baskets are here in the front. I see they need some running repairs because uh, all the tops are off. Maybe someone can do that for us. But our uh, offering will be going towards missions and mercy. So thank you. Can we stretch out our hands to Sarah and just pray for her? Lord, we thank you for Sarah. Thank you for this word that you've put in her heart to share tonight, Lord. And we just pray that you would use this word so powerfully to touch us here tonight, Lord. Help us to concentrate and listen and absorb what she's saying. And Lord, as well, for those listening online, that they would not be distracted, but Lord, they would just concentrate and hear and absorb your word, your Lord, your word that is life and truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Is that on? You happy with the mic, Gav? <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. And also to everyone who's listening online tonight. It's um, a bit different for me to be up here without uh, that instrument between us. I've just got the elephant between us tonight. Um, yeah, but what a privilege for me to be here. And you might be aware if you've been listening to our sermon series over the last few weeks that we are busy working through a series on service and particularly how different people have found their places of service in the body of Christ. And so it's my privilege to share tonight something of my journey. If you're part of our family, then you'll likely know that I am part of the worship team here. And that's kind of been my place of service for, for most of my walk with Christ. And so I just want to unpack a little bit of that tonight and just some of the things that God has taught me um, about himself, about me, about the, the kingdom and the things that he cares about uh, just over that time. So if you know me well, then you will know that I am a huge fan of all things literature and language. So I have called my message tonight, A Tale of Two Ministries, which is a nod to Charles Dickens's historical novel, A Tale of Two Cities. And I was thinking about it afterwards and I thought it's actually quite interesting because that novel starts, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I suppose in some ways that describes my journey as well because there were so many um, good experiences that I had and so many things that looked good on the outside but also so many difficulties that I was wrestling with and so many things that were going on in my heart that I think God wanted to deal with. So that's what I want to share with you tonight. So I, I came into the church serving. I became a Christ follower when I was 16 in my final year of school, and my spiritual dad, who became my spiritual dad, who led me to the Lord, said to me, well, now that you are a believer, it would be good for you to find a church that you can be part of. So I prayed that God would send me somewhere where I was needed. Then after attending a service one night at a local Baptist church, I was leaving and a heavily pregnant woman from the worship team chased me into the parking lot. And she introduced herself and she said to me, this might be a strange question, but are you a born again Christian? And so I told her that it was because let's face it, at that stage I didn't have any frame of reference for what were strange questions for Christians to be asking or not asking in parking lots. And she said to me, well, I'm going to be going off on maternity leave soon, and I've seen you sing in the school musical a few times, and I just wondered if you would have any interest in joining our worship team. And so there was my sign. I was needed. Now, I was one of the few people in the church, two, in fact, one of the two people in the church who would have qualified as youth, and the other person was the pastor's son. And... Everyone else in the church had long since aged out of search and were parents to the children in the children's ministry that I began to lead. They seemed quite old to me, but in retrospect, they were probably around the age that I am now. And then there were plenty of late harvesters. So if you're not here with us regularly or you're watching online and you're not part of the Fountain family, Search is our student church 
and the late harvesters are our over 60s. But despite that, it was a lovely church for me to be part of, and I was very well cared for, and I learned some of the foundational truths of the Christian faith. And of course, I served. Not just in the worship team like I do now, but I served in the children's ministry, and in other areas, I served wherever I was needed. Yet looking back, I wonder if it would ever have occurred to me to ask God to place me somewhere where I was wanted. To ask him to place me somewhere where I belonged. And you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I could have because I don't think that I knew how. Now, don't get me wrong, all of my leaders at the time, their intentions towards me were all good, so my sharing my story tonight is not in any way to question that, but tonight is about the fact that when I came into the church, there is a belief that I was carrying that actually was reinforced instead of dismantled because of the fact that I came in serving. You see, I I believe that my performance correlated to my value. And not only in the eyes of man, but also in the eyes of God. And now this strangely didn't have anything to do with my salvation for me. By the grace of God, I really did believe that my sins had been dealt with once and for all. So this wasn't about me trying to earn my salvation or trying to find right standing with God, but it was just that I couldn't understand how God, or anyone for that matter, could love me or value me if I didn't have something to offer them, if I wasn't bringing something or adding value in some sort of tangible way that I could measure. You might say that I was like a child who believed that I was going to get an inheritance one day, but couldn't quite believe that the same father who was going to leave me the inheritance also loved and valued me in this life. So I couldn't quite believe that I now had a father in heaven who wanted to connect with me, who wanted to care for me, protect me, provide for me, just because I was his daughter and because he loved me. And I felt that I somehow had to earn it. And I actually used to say, you know, it's not eternity that I'm concerned about. It's now that I'm not so sure about. And in Romans 8.32, it says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And you know, it took me a really long time to start believing the second part of that verse. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So I believed this lie, and it began in my human relationships, and then I brought it with me into my relationship with God. I didn't believe that I had value apart from performance or service. I didn't believe that I was worthy of love just in and of myself. This is called self-hatred. Now, I know that sounds really intense, and the first time that I heard it, I was also tempted to just dismiss it. Phew, no, I wouldn't say that I hate myself. It does, it sounds really intense. But in reality, when we think about it, hatred is just the opposite of love. So what is love like? Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, we can read about the fact that love is unconditional. Love believes the best. It forgives. It keeps no records of wrong. It's patient. It's kind. Love is honoring. So, when I don't believe the best about myself, when I don't show myself grace or forgiveness, when I dwell on my past mistakes and judge myself harshly for the mistakes that I've made, when I'm impatient with myself in my weakness, 
when I'm unkind to myself, when I dishonor either my body or my soul or my spirit, when I do any of those things, I'm actually operating in the spirit of self-hatred rather than love. And although I wasn't aware of it at the time, I was actually incredibly bound by self-hatred. And it actually led me to over-function. It led me to perform because I found value in that place. And the really tragic thing is that this lie that I believed, it didn't only affect the way that I saw myself. It also affected the way that I saw other people. Have you ever heard the saying, you can't give away what you don't have? Well, I had heard it taught and I had even taught it myself repeatedly that value didn't come from performance. But that was not what I believed in my heart. I hadn't received a revelation of that truth. I knew in my head that it was correct, but that truth hadn't made its way to my heart yet. And so it led me to judge people in my heart. Yes, I would say to them, belonging is more important than the team that you serve in. Or, you know, the church is a family. It's not just an organization. Or church is not just about the Sunday services. Yes, I'd learned those truths. But that was not what I believed. And so this started to affect the way that I evaluated other people's maturity, their love for the body of Christ, even their love for God. I was judging them in my heart. See, I associated maturity with service, and not just for myself, but also for other people. Now, just to be clear, the problem was never with the serving, but it was what was going on in here when I was serving. Serving is biblical, and Jesus modeled servanthood for us during his time on earth. Maria preached this morning out of John 13, and if you haven't listened to it, I really encourage you to do so. What an incredible message, just of the humility and servanthood that Jesus modeled for us and encouraged us to walk in. So serving was not the problem. Outwardly, my service looked good. I was using the gifts that God had given me. But inwardly, something toxic had developed over the years, and it actually left me quite angry and disillusioned. Now, before I tell you the rest of my story, I want to take you to the story of the beginning of another ministry. And it's a ministry that began very differently to mine. Now, remember, ministry just means service, to ministers to serve. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there with me, but it's going to come up on the screen as well. We're going to go to Mark 1, verse 9. And this is the account of the start of Jesus' ministry. From verse 9, it says, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. So there are a few points that I'd like to draw out for us tonight. Just to contrast the way that my ministry in the church began in comparison to the way that Jesus' ministry began. The first point that I want to highlight for you is that when Jesus began to serve, he already understood what it was to receive from someone else's ministry. That's what it says in verse 9. He came so that he could be baptized by John in the Jordan. If you're not familiar with John the Baptist, that was the ministry that he had. He went around baptizing people in water, proclaiming the fact that Jesus was to come. So Jesus came to receive from him. Think about how different that is to what I experienced. I came in not really knowing at all what it was to receive in the church, but I came in serving. And I, I love the emphasis here at Fountain where we say, 
You should first be, and then you should belong, and then you should do. Because it just builds on that fact that we need to understand what it is first to receive and to feel like we actually belong in family so that we're not just preaching the church as a family, but we actually live it and then come to a place of bringing the gifts that we have to offer to serve the family. Now in verse 10, it says that Jesus saw heaven opened and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Now, I, I believe that this is what we would call being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And in fact, all four Gospels have an account of Jesus' baptism in one way or another. They're not absolutely identical. But they all record the fact that the Spirit came to rest on him. So this must be significant. And I love Mark's phrasing. He says, he saw heaven being torn open. It's a much more active phrasing than um, the other three Gospels that talk about the fact that heaven was opened. And I love the image that it creates almost of this father acting in the significant moment in his son's life, a father reaching for his son in this moment. And we know that the Holy Spirit is significant because of what we read in Acts 1. After Jesus' resurrection, just before he ascends to heaven, this is what he instructs his disciples. He says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then if you jump down to verse 8, it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So it's clear that one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to empower us for ministry. So logically, it makes sense that Jesus should also receive the empowerment of the Spirit at the start of his ministry. But did you know that this is not the only role of the Holy Spirit? Let's go to Romans 8 and read from verse 14. It says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, which means Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I'm just going to read verse 16 again. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And it's this scripture that actually reveals the other role of the Holy Spirit, which is to affirm for us the fact that we're God's children, so that, again, it's not just something that we preach and know with our minds, but it's something that we have revelation of and understand with our hearts or with our spirits. I've heard it said that the Holy Spirit is both for friendship and for function. So yes, Jesus received the Holy Spirit to empower him, to minister, but he also received the Holy Spirit to affirm for him that he was a son. And I'd like to propose that perhaps this may even have been the priority of Father God in this moment, simply because of what we see next in this encounter. So that brings me to my third point. A voice came from heaven saying, you are my son, with you I'm well pleased. And some of the other gospel accounts say, this is my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. This affirmation from the father comes to Jesus before he has done or offered anything. Not one thing. And he's being affirmed. And as I said, some of the other gospels say, this is my beloved son. Beloved is an intensive form of loved. It means very much loved. This is my very much loved son. And in Matthew's gospel, he actually records the statement as being addressed to the crowd. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And either way, although we don't know if it was addressed directly to Jesus, you are my beloved son, or this is my beloved son, addressed to the crowd, I know that as a child, there's nothing that we love more than to be affirmed by a parent 
both personally and publicly. To have somebody affirm us and stand up for us publicly is such a significant thing. So, again, well pleased. An intensive form of pleased. Not just my son with whom I'm pleased, my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And so we see here that for the father, love and value are connected to relationship, not role, not performance. So, about three years ago, the Lord started me on a journey of learning what it means to be loved by him, to be his daughter, and to live and love and serve from that place. And there's many ways and contexts that he used to do this in my heart and to bring revelation to me of this truth. I'm not able to go into all the details now as much as I would love to, but they involved everything from speaking to me about the way that I care for myself, or don't, confronting me about certain things that I do or don't do just because I'm afraid of what other people or even God will think if I do them or don't do them. You might say that God, fin that he dared me to finally believe that he loves me unconditionally. Again, I taught it and I knew it up here, but he dared me to live like I believed it. And he challenged me to love myself and think about myself in the way that he does. To love myself unconditionally. To forgive myself. To keep no records of my wrongs. To be patient and kind to myself, to honor myself, because this is how he loves me. And you know, on my journey of service, I've come to realize that God he doesn't need me to serve him. He is the God who speaks a word and forms universes. I mean, if anybody has the right to say, if you want something done properly, do it yourself, it's God. Yet, why doesn't he? For those of you who knew the late Barry Stratum, you would likely have heard him say at one point or another that God is relational above all else. And I must say that I have found this to be true. And I've also found that service, the act of partnering together with God, is actually one of the things that God loves to connect around. He loves to build with his children, not because he needs us, but because he wants us. And that's the very thing that I couldn't see when I came into the church 18 years ago. I couldn't conceive of a God who simply wanted me. I prioritized function over family, and I prioritized service over love. But there are verses in Scripture like Hosea 6, verse 6, that says, I want you to show love not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. That's the way the New Living Translation phrases it. So now when I serve, I do it from a place of knowing that I'm wanted by a father who loves me. There's nothing, not one thing, that I could give to him that he could not have by simply speaking a word. But what I give to him and what he receives from me and what he gives to me and what I receive from him, we now exchange in a love relationship. And we get to delight in connecting with one another in that process. The author C.S. Lewis once said, God does not want something from us. He simply wants us. And you know, this revelation of God's love and acceptance in my life has also impacted the way that I see others service and also the way that I lead them in service. 
now I no longer see other people's value as correlating to their service or what they bring because I no longer see myself in that way. I'm now finally able to give away what I've received. So there is greater freedom in the way that I serve, but also greater freedom in the way that I lead. Because it means that when I come to serve, I have an expectation that I'm going to connect not only with God, but also the people that I'm serving with. And it means that there's an atmosphere, and I feel like we've heard this so often over the last few weeks, there's an atmosphere of we get to, not we have to. Now, I sincerely believe that service is one of the ways that God loves to connect. It's not the only way, but it is one of them. And now I'm not just doing it for him, but with him. And I have come to think of this as the process of being rooted and established in love, the way that Ephesians 3 talks about. And I hope that I'm coming to some kind of grasp, like Paul writes in that scripture, of how high and how long and how high and deep the love of Christ is. And as I finish with sharing my story tonight, I think it's, I would love to pray that prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesian church over each one of you tonight. Because I feel like one of the things that that prayer does really well is it highlights the truth that it's actually the Holy Spirit that gives us revelation of God's love and gives us revelation of the fact that we are sons and daughters. And so tonight, just as we we go into ministry and as we go into a time of worship, that's what I really want to pray that the Holy Spirit would do in, in each one of our hearts. So if I can just invite Liam and Joel and Sim and Jono to come up Yeah, I'd just love to pray with you. Oh, Jesus. We just honor you tonight, Lord God. We thank you so much, Lord, just for what you purchased for us at the cross. We thank you for your word that says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so even tonight, Lord, as I pray, I trust that your Holy Spirit is going to be doing significant work in people's hearts. And this is my prayer for you tonight. I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And I want to pray that over you as well in the, in the Passion Translation because I love just this paraphrase and just how it captures some of the intimacy that the love of God carries. I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on earth. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then, by constantly using your faith, 
the life of Christ will be released deep inside you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you will be empowered to discover what every holy one experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. So now, we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church in every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. I had some words for, for people that I felt like might be significant tonight just in, in God ministering to people's hearts and, and just revealing his love to them. And I just want to say, just as I share these, you are, you are most welcome to claim any part of these words that you feel resonate with you for two reasons. One, because I don't hear the Lord perfectly but two, because I don't believe that God needs to give you a prophetic word to meet you where you are. So if there's anything tonight that you think, yeah, yeah, maybe that's something that God wants to deal with in my heart, then I just invite you to respond to them tonight. Um, I don't know if this resonates with anyone, but is there anyone that you are aware that when your mother was pregnant with you, she experienced some health complications and she still experiences some health complications today. And because of that, there has almost been like this guilt that you've carried where you felt that you are, that you somehow responsible for it. And I felt like maybe you have even thought the words at one time or another, maybe it would have been better if I hadn't been born anyone who that resonates with, that you, you wrestle with the fact that maybe it would have been better if you weren't born. I realize some of these things are, they're quite vulnerable to, to say yes to. So even if there is something that later you want to just come find me in the worship and just receive prayer, that, that's totally fine. And then someone here tonight where I believe that for about the last year or two, You've experienced really high levels of anxiety. And the, the phrase that I kept seeing is it's, it's like the earth spinning on its axis and you feel that if you stop, everything will just fly off into space. But you know that you need to stop because you've started to experience some health issues. I felt specifically like heart palpitations or near panic attacks where you know that you, you need to deal with the anxiety that you're facing, but you're not quite sure how, how. I'd love to pray with you tonight if that's something that you're wrestling with. And then I believe there's somebody, I, I think that you're a woman, but I might be wrong in that, somebody who, who moved house or moved city and around that same time experienced some kind of trauma. And I feel like you have you have had professional help in dealing with the trauma, but your memories of that time are still quite traumatic for you. And I felt like the Holy Spirit really wanted to, to bring healing to that area tonight. I, I, I'm not sure if it 
may have happened when you were 13 or 14, or if it happened around the years 2013, 2014. I might be, I might be wrong on those, but if there's anybody that would like prayer for something like that, I'd love to pray with you. And then just finally, I saw, I saw a picture of somebody, I think that you're a man, and I saw that you had, you had made an error at work where you had filled in something incorrectly, I think on a form, and it had, the result was that it had cost your company some money. And although it's in the past and everybody at work has moved on from it, I feel like you carry a fear of making mistakes when it comes to your work. So also, I'd, I'd love to pray with you. And just for anyone during, during the worship, if there's somebody who would like prayer for something where you feel like this is just something that I wrestle with when it comes to believing that God loves me or believing that I have value just for who I am. I've been created with value. I'd really just love to pray with you at some point during the worship time. So we're going to worship and, and Liam is going to lead us. Liam, I really felt like tonight I needed to just honor you publicly just for what you carry as a worship leader and just how you've grown as a worship leader as well. I, I have so much respect for you as a leader and I just wanted to say to you that you I have insiders you know who tell me about how you prepare for worship they're here tonight and I know that you're so diligent in how you prepare and you're so teachable and I feel like you have brought a new accountability into my life because when I lead with you I know that you want to practice and I know that you want to prepare and so it causes me to to do that well because I don't want to let you down in it and so I just want to thank you just for bringing that into my life as well and just thank you just for how you serve us and we just know that yeah we just that we can always look forward to just encountering the presence of God when you lead us in worship so thank you you stand? Well, I invite you to stand. Dad, thank you that you're here. Thank you that you're tangible. Heaven and 
when I feel I'm worthless, when I feel I'm no good, I remember the holes in your head. Now I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. When you say. I believe you when you say that you make me holy, you make me worthy through the blood that you spilt on the faithful day. You make me holy, you make me worthy. You're the one you call. Tells me I am found And when I think it's hopeless When I think there's no point I remember the holes in your hands And when I feel I'm worthless When I feel I'm moving I remember the holes in your hands
Jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory, and I realize. Just how beautiful you are and how great your affection for me And oh, how he loves us all And oh, how he loves us How he loves us all And oh, Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes 
If grace is an ocean we're all sinking So heaven meets a flock Slap you with kiss And my heart turns violent inside of my chest And I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I So when heaven meets earth like sloppy wet kiss in my heart turns violent inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way he loves us Oh why he loves us Oh why Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Let's just take a moment. Let's just just wait on Him as we as we wrap up, as we end off. Just all the things, all the things He's been saying over our lives, all the things that He's beginning to touch on. Just feel like the Lord is just wanting to speak. He just wants to make clear the things that uh, have been tugged in our hearts this evening. The 
things that he's drawing us to. So come, Holy Spirit, come and speak, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. And I just pray of us as we end off now. Just, just pray for freedom. And as, as Sarah was sharing tonight, Lord, that we become people who know, first of all, that you are loved. And it's not about what we do or how we act, but it's our being and it's our identity and it's how we live and who we are. So break free in Jesus' name. Break free from control. Break free from action and do and more. We pray we just come back to that Father's heart this week, Lord. Reveal yourself. And as I was sitting there, I was just, what do we pray? What do we say, Lord? How do we, how do we become more intimate with you? And I felt like the Lord was just saying, just ask. Just come, Lord. And so this week, it's just a prayer of come, Holy Spirit, come, Lord. And He will take over. He will speak. He will move. So come, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Bless you. You guys are amazing. Bless you. Thank you, guys, for joining us. We're going to keep on soaking if you want to. If you want some more prayer. Um, we are still here. Um, the coffee shop is not open, unfortunately. But we're going to end there. So stay as long as you want. Um, have a chat, have a conversation. Um, stay for a while. Soak as long as you want. We'll be here for prayer if you need. But that's how we're going to end it. So bless you guys. Amen. <laughs>